you know, it's something about God's comforting words. Sometimes we're so afraid. We don't want to try again. We just want to drop the baton and run the other way, run off the track, run out of the game, give up on ourselves. You're the one giving up, not God. Let me read something to you. Listen to this. Mm -hmm. This is uh, Mark chapter 2. Verse 15, 16, and 17. Now check this out. And it came to pass that as Jesus sat at meat in his house, many publicans and sinners sat also together with Jesus and his disciples. For there were many, and they followed him. And when the scribes and Pharisees, church folk, <clears throat> saw him eat with publicans and sinners, they said unto the disciples, How is it that he eateth and drinketh with publicans and sinners? You know, that's how the Bible is just kind of becoming a little redundant there. Republic, I mean, publicans, sorry. <laughs> publicans and sinners. Yeah, we'll leave that alone. Okay, verse 17. When Jesus heard it, he said unto them, They that are whole, mm, you think you got it all together as my pat's two cents. They that are whole have no need of a physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Mm. Do you know how powerful that is? He didn't go to the polished higher echelon of society to make them shine that much more than they already were. No, he went to the, what some of us might call the dregs of society, the untouchables, the unworthy, the nobodies. Mm. Yeah, and the thing I love about his love, nobody is out of his reach. Nobody who wants to be around him, will he kick away from him. He doesn't reject those that accept him. He doesn't reject those that are reaching out to him. He doesn't do that. We do. We'll cross on the other side of the street to avoid some folks, won't we? But not him. He won't cross on the other side of the street to avoid you when you're at the bottom of your game. Some of your friends and family may see the phone and they'll look, they'll hear it ring and they'll see the number and they'll be like, oh no, no, <laughs> I don't want to be bothered with him. I don't want to be, mm -mm. But guess what? God, I'm right here. What do you need? Not, you know what? Yeah, you put yourself in this. You made your bed, lay in it. Nope, that's not God. God is how much help do you want? What do you want me to do for you? I'm here for you. I'm for you, not against you. I'm on your side. I'm pulling for you. I know the plans I have for you. Plans to bless you, not harm you. I mean, God is so in our corner. You know, I remember when um, I've seen people who lived on the street 10, 12, 13, 14 years. People that nobody else would even talk to or look at for that matter. And you know when God got through polishing them up, healing them, putting them back together again? Some of them served in the body of Christ in such beautiful ways. Either preaching the gospel or leading men's fellowship or, or leading overcomers meeting with other people 
who were in the same trick bag they were in years ago. And now he gets to show these people who he was once one of how God can come and put you back together again. It's something about the way God works. He is driven. He is drawn to the broken. He's drawn to the useless. He's drawn to the rejects of society. He's drawn to the messed up, the jacked up, the lost, the blind, crippled, crazy. He is drawn to the impotent. And I don't mean sexually, I mean impotent. To the powerless. He's drawn. Yet, here's the beautiful part. Let me share this with you real quick. Uh, I was at a church. My husband and I went to visit a church in L.A. called the Dream Center. Now, this ministry, uh, the pastor's name is Barnett. I'm not good with names, so that's as good as it's going to get. And his son and, and son and father collaborated together to get this ministry going. And it focused in on the lost the invisible, the broken souls of society. And they bought a hospital and created rooms and they were housing and they, and they got buses and they were busing and they were feeding families in the neighborhood and praying. I mean, they just had an all out assault basically on the damage that pulled these people down. But they went in with love, hope, tenderness, compassion, the compassion and love of God. And a lot of people's lives were changed miraculously and permanently. Now listen, listen. My husband and I went to visit the church. We went to the church service. Okay. They pre They had worship. They prayed. They preached. I was not. Now listen, listen before you write me off. This is not a criticism. I'm just saying. I was not impressed by anything that took place in the service. But you know what impressed me? Two things impressed me. As I looked around. I was amazed at how many gangbangers and drug dealers and prostitutes and alcoholics and and, and uh, drug users, substance abusers. Uh, I mean, I was really shocked at how this church was loaded with people that many of us would deem Ooh. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Listen. This is the beautiful part. You could tell some of them just stepped off the bus from prison, from jail, doing time for major crimes, murderers, drunks, rapists. I mean, <laughs> sitting there in a church service. Some of them still stinking from the life they lived. Some of them still ugly, worn, and torn from the life they lived. But you know, that amazed me. What amazed me even more was the presence of God. Oh, let me tell you, you guys. Some of you may not have wanted to go to that church. You may not, you may have been afraid of who might sit next to you. Mm-mm. Maybe I better change pews. Uh oh, ooh, too many of these people around me. But let me tell you something God and all his holiness and his might and his love swooped down in that church service, you guys. 
I mean, you could feel my husband even commented. He said, boy, you can really feel. I said, I know God's presence. He said, yeah. It was amazing. Throughout the whole service. You know, sometimes we have church services and God will show up in, in a segment. Like, oh boy, you feel God's presence. Praise God. Oh, beautiful. And you just want to bask in his presence. But in this service, it was like he was there through the whole thing. And you could feel a sense of his heart just reaching out. I mean, it was so touching that if you weren't sure how to respond, just by the way God's tender compassionate warmth was literally blanketing the people in the sanctuary. You could tell that he was doing the same thing that he did when they saw him eating with publicans and sinners. He was in a church loaded with them. And the church was loaded, packed, solid with his presence as a result. You know, that's one of the reasons I always love prison ministry. We can sit up in church and we can all be, you know, be all dressed up, you know, you know, think, we're, oh, we smell good. Oh, yeah, boy, I know I'm fine today. I'm looking cute. Mm -hmm. Got my Gucci this and my whatever else that. And, yeah, I'm looking good, Jack. But you look around, look around all day long, you may never see God in there. May not feel him, may not sense him. He actually may not even be moving. But you go to a prison ministry and you sit up amongst those prisoners and you watch those people, the ones who are really reaching out, being honest with themselves about where they are, coming to grips. And all of a sudden you start seeing God move in ways that you don't see him move in church. Because he said, they that are whole, you church people that think you got it together, you're living a holy life, and hey, me and God are like this. And you talk in tongues for 12 hours straight, fasting, praying, giving to the poor, serving your church, serving your church, praising God. In the midst of the sanctuary. Mm -hmm. But these people. The broken people. Are sitting up. In a service. Not knowing who they are. And knowing they don't know who they are. Not having a clue. Have lost their grip on life. Have lost themselves. In the midst of their turmoil. And confusion. Knowing so, they that are whole need no have no need of a physician. You church folks, you got it all going on. I'm happy for you. But you know the ones who will get the help the quickest are the ones. But they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Yeah. So for those of you holy rollers and Church of God in Christ and Pentecostal and Baptocostal and Baptist and Catholic and Episcopalian and and uh, uh, Methodist and all uh, all you uppity ups sitting up in the church wearing your usher badge and your and your. <clears throat> And your elder badge and your and whatever. Some of you have really lost touch with reality. I'm sorry to say, I'm not saying it to be judgmental. But Jesus said it himself. He who has been forgiven much loves much. And you will find more love. 
in some of these people sitting in a pod in jail. Some of them will be the quickest to give their life for you. When you wouldn't give them the time of day. <laughs> but guess what? I thank God for my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I thank God for my Father in heaven. He will always have enough love to go around. And he'll always have enough love to reach down into the guttermost and bring those people up to the uttermost. And I was one of those people that he brought up out of the gutter. And you can be too. Don't give up on yourself. Don't give up on life. See what God will do. There's a song, and I quote, it was my personal testimony. Someone else wrote it, but, you know, here are the words. He took me and made something beautiful out of my life. He took a wretch, a wretch like me, and showed me his love and concern. And by his grace, he made my life a new and better one. I owe him my all. I could never let him down. For he's the one who made something beautiful out of my life.